So, hello, good morning, good evening, and welcome to all of you. I am super excited that so many colleagues from all over the world are participating in this first of our three expert talks in the context of the Emerging International Voices program that the Goethe Institute is conducting together with IFLA. My name is Brigitte Dölgast. Uh, I'm the head of the library department at the Goethe Institute in Munich. The Goethe Institute, as you may know, is the cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany with a global reach. We promote knowledge of German language abroad and foster international cultural cooperation. We have 157 institutes in 97 countries and 96 of these institutes also have a library. So libraries are considered to be an important part of the work of the Goethe Institute. And beside the network of our own libraries, we do a lot of projects with library partners. And of course, of collab our collaboration with IFLA plays an especially important role in this. And I'm very happy that in the long list of joint projects and activities, we start this latest initiative, the Emerging International Voices Program. First and foremost, my thanks goes to Gosha Chabai, Head of Information at the Goethe Institute in London and her colleagues. Gosha came up with the idea for the project after her participation at the IFLA in Athens last year. She quickly convinced the colleagues at the Goethe Institutes around the world that it would be really important to bring international young voices in the library community closer together who are already active on social media. As it says in the program, they are young, they are bold and they are connected and they are the future of our libraries. And we want to assist them to do this even better. After consultations with Barbara Lison, incoming president of IFLA and Gerald Leitner, secretary general of IFLA, IFLA came on board as well and together with Stefan Wieber, manager of policy and advocacy at IFLA, we planned this program for a truly amazing group of young librarians with a truly amazing group of experienced speakers. We start with the first session, which looks at the question, digitalized libraries, why, what, and how? And without further ado, I hand over to Gerald Leitner, who will act as a moderator. Thank you and enjoy the meeting. Thank you, Brigitte, for uh, your words and your introduction. And of course, for all that the Goethe Institute does for libraries and library users globally. I'm happy as always to be, work, to be working in partnership with the Goethe Institute and especially with you, Brigitte. And I'm particularly fascinated by what we are doing here today. As you may know, IFLA recently carried out the largest and most inclusive conversation in the history of the library field, the IFLA Global Vision Initiative in order to understand the strengths, concerns, and priorities of libraries around the world. Building on the tens of thousands of responses received, we identified 10 key highlights and opportunities. I encourage you to take a look at our report, of course, and see how these match with our own experience and your experience. But among these opportunities were the need to ensure that libraries have access to digital technologies, to take advantage of the possibilities to digitize services, to develop stronger partnerships, and to provide opportunities for the leaders of the future. In this one initiative here today, and for the next two weeks, I believe that we are making a step towards all of them. Libraries have arguably long been leaders in digital. Indeed, through our work to store, catalog, and give access to information, including between institutions across borders, libraries were the internet before the internet. Yet to quote one of my favorite writers, Tomasi Giuseppe di Lampedusa, he said, 
If we want things to stay the same, things will have to change. And in a changing world with changing expectations and changing possibilities, library must work to understand, evaluate and respond. Crucially, this is not a discussion where any one person or institution has a monopoly on good ideas. When we think we have found the right answers, the world is likely to move on. Rather, we need to draw on everyone's expertise and experience all the time to develop a practice of reflection and sharing of ideas. To do this, we have so much to gain from ensuring that we are bringing forward the thought leaders of the future, our emerging international voices. People who can think around the issues, spot the similarities, the differences between experience. People who can make the connections with the impacts good libraries have on the community they serve. People who can ensure that we, as a global field, have a truly global conversation. And people who can also then take the message out, not just to the library community, but also beyond. And people who can explain to others, politicians, founders, influencers, other decision makers, my libraries are as important as ever, even more important than ever. This is what I hope we can achieve through this work, starting with this first session today on digital and digitalized libraries. What, how, and why? I just have two pieces of housekeeping for you. We welcome questions, of course. To do this, please use the question and answer function in Zoom. We have enabled the possibility for you to vote for questions, which you find most interesting also. So to share your views that way, please. And secondly, please feel free to share your reactions as we go on on social media. For this, please use the hashtag Emerging International Voices. So get us started. I wanted to hand over to Stephen Weiber, our manager for advocacy, for a first question. Please, Stephen, start. Thank you very much, Gerald, for the floor, and of course, welcome to everyone. Um, in order to, to make this dynamic, what we wanted to do to start off with is to ask you a question. And so what you should see up on the screen is a poll. And the question is, on a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is excellently and 1 is not at all, how well do you think that libraries in your country are taking advantage of the possibilities offered by digital technologies? So let's give you a minute for that. And then I will share the answers at the end. Coming in, very good. We've got 30 already have voted, going up quickly. 30 seconds gone. I can tell you already, we, we, we have a, a group of cautious optimists here. We've got 92 have voted. I think we'll get up to 100 pretty soon. Okay, so 10 seconds to go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And there we go. And I'm going to share the results on the screen. And so I think, as you can see, we have seen, it seems like the people we have here today are, we have a group of cautious optimists. The biggest votes are for seven and eight. Not There's only two incredibly optimistic people, but also only two very pessimistic people. So we'll be asking the same question at the again, uh, again at the end to see how you feel. Thank you. So I will now hand back to Gerald. Thank you, Stephen, for this first exercise, uh, which will help us uh, to go further. And I'm really pleased and excited uh, to introduce our first speaker today, who is Professor Baza Braden Das. Professor Das is head of the Rechandra Mishra School of Engineering Entrepreneurship at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur as well as principal investigator at the National Digital Library of India. He had a great career as a teacher, an entrepreneur, a father, and a mentor, working in both businesses and education. 
He has a particular interest in heritage, building a bridge between the traditional and the digital. Alongside his work to develop the National Digital Library as a key support for education and learning, he's also working on computer analysis of Indian classical dance. With such a varied CV and a great experience, I'm looking forward to hearing your perspectives, Professor. The floor is yours. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Gerald. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, I would first uh, pull up uh, a presentation uh, that I want to follow. Uh, I, I, I hope the presentation is visible. That works, yes, thank you. Uh, good. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, welcome uh, uh, everybody. Really want to thank uh, Get Institute and IFLA for this opportunity of sharing uh, my experience with the emerging international voices. Really look forward to the challenge from the young minds. Uh, just to uh, uh, frankly share, I mean confess rather, that uh, I'm not a library scientist uh, per se. I'm a computer scientist and I have always been that. Uh, it's uh, this particular project of National Digital Library of India, which uh, the Ministry of Education uh, decided to build in uh, 2014, about uh, six years back, is uh, when uh, me with my, some of my colleagues in the Institute were entrusted to build this. And that's when I started learning library science. So, I learned library science. Uh, I learned libraries through the eyes of the digital, digitalized libraries. And that's, uh, uh, that's the perspective, that's the experience. And the last five to six years with specific focus on the last uh, six months, which have uh, kind of shown the power of the digital in an in a extremely different way is what I'm going to share with you in the next couple of minutes. So to briefly, uh, I'm sure most uh, of the participants here, I mean, probably all are familiar with why digital, but uh, still just to put the analysis uh, on the crisp platform is, if we draw a parallel in terms of the basic services, then these are the services on left uh, with the traditional library with the uh, search browse through cataloging and primarily for that. And uh, then we can borrow, return. We have book clubs of reference library and, and so on and so forth. Uh, you have all of that in the digital library and uh, certainly uh, all of that happened in a digital form. So where the catalog could have been searched in terms of maybe author and subject and uh, a uh, few fields, uh, now search can happen in really multitude of fields, combination of fields, filters, and so on. So the dimension becomes very, very different. The whole concept of browsing, borrowing becomes different. And of course, what uh, is uh, significantly different uh, is the scale at which it can operate. You know, the scale at which the collections can happen, the scale at which the borrowings or the usage can happen. But that's the translation of the traditional uh, library services in the digital but or digitalized form. But what gives uh, really a new dimension is the fact that there are a whole lot of extensional services that uh, are actually uh, gets real with the digital library. And of course, the starting of it is uh, being anytime, anywhere. I mean, it's anytime access 24 by seven anywhere. You can log in to a digital library from anywhere. You can have multi-format data where in a traditional library, we would typically possibly have uh, books and articles, printed documents, maps, and so on. Here we have multi-formatted data, multimedia presentations with videos, audios, all different kinds of including interactive content and so on and so forth. So this extensionality gives a different dimension to the whole digital perspective of the library. Now, actually, if you, if you look at these, then these are kind of, I say extensional because these are kind of, you know, some, uh, you know, minor to, you know, medium range changes based on what the traditional libraries have had had. But there are things which are kind of disruptive in a way, in the sense that uh, uh, libraries are now talking about data discovery. 
because uh, the whole world is being driven by data science. So a library of what is named has to provide a lot of data science oriented services, data mining services. It has to provide compute databases, uh, use of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning, machine learning are providing very, very smart ways of using the library, the level of personalization that is possible. That traditional library is kind of a uh, purely full model. I mean, the user has to know what the user needs and has to find out in the traditional library, in the digital library. The use of AI is making a push model very, very familiar in terms of uh, personalization, but depending on the background of the user, the earlier use pattern of the user, the library could suggest what is the best content that the, the that is there for a particular search. So, you know, with this uh, services, the digital library takes a very, very different dimension. And naturally, if we, if we talk in terms of a very specific, you know, uh, broad level, broad user group services, then this will fall into educational services, open and inclusiveness uh, of being anytime, anywhere, uh, having, uh, you know, uh, preserving heritage, cultural heritage is a big dimension of uh, digital uh, libraries because you can digitally preserve a lot more of the heritage than you could physically do and disseminate them in very, very different dimensions. Examples like Europeana and uh, uh, Digital Public Library of America have shown as to what is the power of uh, digital preservation when you bring it to the digital libraries. So uh, moving on uh, from uh, why, I a little bit try to uh, touch upon what is a digital library. Now, what is a digital library is now become a very, very open question. So I'm just uh, putting up a few points which uh, um, the library that I have been instrumental in building, the digital library that I have been instrumental in building actually is, but a digital library could go well beyond that. So it is, it is kind of a 24 by seven enabled infrastructure, which anybody can use from anywhere. It can be integrated from resources uh, from any partner. I mean, it's not necessary like the physical library to have actual real possession of the content. Obviously it produces, it has single window search browse facility covers dynamic, very diverse uh, ranges of academic uh, levels, disciplines, could be for schools, colleges, uh, could have variety of collections depending on the orientation. It could be education focused collections. It could be heritage focused collections. It could be picture focused collections and so on. Multimedia contents uh, can be there. Multiple language interfaces could be there. Support for differently able uh, could uh, be a significant part of the digital library. So there's a, that what a digital library can be is uh, probably now it's become a very different definition to put in a single or on two words. And then uh, how you do that is of course, uh, provide varied kinds of the digital access, which could be through now typically through mobile or through the internet, through your desktop and so on. And uh, certainly through this, the digital library could help in multiple dimensions of uh, you know, touching the life it could transform education like the way uh, the National Digital Library of India is trying to do, or it could be uh, preserving the heritage of a, of a, of a region uh, like Europeana tries to do, or preserving the endangered, uh, you know, uh, culture of a region like uh, some of the other, uh, you know, digital library of the Middle East is trying to do and so on. So, it is, it is kind of uh, having an objective of, uh, you know, how you want to preserve, what you want to preserve, and then go ahead and create the digitalized version for that. So if we look at the quick journey of uh, how does uh, a, a digital library has been emerging. So this is, this is just, you know, a quick perspective that I drew based on what has been happening in the last six months where we had a, a lot of disruption and uh, very little opportunity for planning. So I was just uh, uh, putting it together that, uh, you know, how you do a digital library, if you look into 20 years back, 30 years back, Project Gutenberg, one of the initial ones, which 
thought a uh, very structured way in terms of digital library from that uh, pre-digital library or early digital library stage where mostly things were uh, physical. We had been putting in a lot of planning and uh, kind of moving on to digital books, multimedia content, search, browse. So the digital library came in or digitalization came in in small steps, also leading to uh, distance learning, online learning, flipped classroom. I mean, these are these are things that the digital library started facilitating. But you know, there was to be a lot of uh, planning and making sure that you don't disrupt things uh, so much and so forth. But then uh, certainly COVID happened. On one day, uh, the whole world changed. The institutions were closed. Uh, students were sent back to home. Examinations were canceled. Conferences were called off. And immediately, the, the, the whole digital world started responding through online classes, online evaluation, online conferences, and so on. And if you look at this, in this whole gamut of uh, learning, education, and uh, experience sharing, you'll see that all this brought digital library even more at the center of learning. So there was hardly any time to plan, there was hardly any time to make elaborate uh, you know, decisions of how you go about doing this. You had to react very quickly. It was a high disruption and a low planning activity which brought in digital library in the prime focus of uh, on COVID, uh, you know, uh, some of the significant things that has happened during this COVID uh, pandemic. So this is also how a digital library happens. And I'm sure going forward, whether it is post COVID or co COVID, digital libraries are going to be for knowledge in action. It, it will mean access for all. It will mean democratization of a different order, openness, inclusiveness of a different order in every segment of uh, the human society and it will prove to be open space for interaction for all. So with these uh, words, uh, I would just uh, chart out our recent journey in terms of uh, the COVID time. These are some of the things that our library has uh, provided. I can discuss, uh, use this as examples when uh, we keep on discussions later on. For now, I will uh, stop my remarks and give it back to Jared for continuation. Thank you, Professor Das, for this uh, great uh, speech. Uh, we, were, we are very thankful for it. And uh, we will give the chance to ask questions after the second speaker. And I would like to introduce now uh, Kathy uh, Mofat. Kathy is the head of digital at the audience agency. She's an experienced consultant, trainer, and strategist, and has been working in the field of digital for over 18 years. In her work at the audience agency, she works with clients to help them develop effective ways to use digital tools and technologies to reach, grow, and diversify the audience with a strong focus on arts, culture, and heritage organizations. Kathy is a contributor to the Manual of Digital Museum Planning, published by Roman and Littlefield, and is a board trustee of Digital Pioneers Abandon Normal Devices. She is also much in demand as a speaker, and so I'm thrilled that she is with us today. Kathy, the floor is yours. Lovely. Thank you so much for that um, warm introduction. Um, so I am also just going to share my uh, screen to share a little presentation I have. So. Yes, yeah, so thank you again. I'm delighted to be here um, to talk about creating user centered digital platforms. Um, so I'm not a computer scientist and I'm also not a librarian. Um, my area of specialty is about understanding user behavior um, uh, and how to reach and grow users, particularly those that you might not currently be uh, reaching. So when I use the word users, I kind of use that interchangeably uh, to mean audiences or customers or students, um, you know, however, however you, you, term, you term your audiences. 
Um, so, yes, as um, Gerard said, I am uh, head of digital at the Audience Agency. We are a charity. Uh, we work in the UK and internationally, and we work uh, specifically in the arts, culture, museums, heritage, uh, libraries and archives sector. Um, we have specialist researchers and consultants and really um, the, the main focus of what we do is about understanding audiences and users and what they do and why they, they do um, what they do and so on. Um, so today, um, just in a brief presentation, I want to draw on our experience working with different types of organisations to think about um, creating digital libraries and platforms that work for different types of audiences and users. Um, so my examples that I'm going to um, just briefly talk about are drawn from a kind of wide range of different types of organizations, but the principles certainly apply, um, you know, for digital libraries very, very much so. And I wanted just to kind of start with the question that was posed in the description for this session, um, which was, how can we make sure that we create platforms that suit the user's needs? And, and the, at the audience agency, we always talk to organizations and clients about putting users um, at the heart of what they do. Um, so, you know, whether you're a museum with an online collection, an, an archive or a library, it's thinking about who your users are and what it is that they want from you. So, so you know, you can boil that down to who, who are they? Why are they coming? You know, what's their motivation? What do they want? Um, and how can we best serve them? Um, so although this might sound quite obvious, um, it's not uncommon, particularly with digital um, platforms and products um, to build them based on our kind of internal systems for classifying things, our intuition or our assumptions about what we think users want and so on. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so. I want to talk a little bit about human centered design, which I'm sure many of you will have be familiar with some of you for those of you who aren't um, human centered design, which is sometimes called user centered design, uh, sometimes shortened to design thinking is a process um, for thinking about your users and putting your users at the center of what you do and what you create. So it's a focus on understanding the perspective of the person who is experiencing or using your particular um, service or, or offer and, and, and dealing with any kind of problems or barriers or challenges that they may have. Um, and so design thinking is a process that can be used um, to design all sorts of things and to build all sorts of things, products, platforms, services, experiences. From a digital perspective, you can use it um, if you're you know, building something from scratch from day one. You can also use it to refine your approach on an ongoing basis um, to improve sort of the user experience. And for those of you who are uh, new, newer to uh, design thinking and human centered design, it generally has a, a process that follows this particular cycle. Um, the first stage is about empathy. It's about understanding your users, your community, um, what it is that, you know, what the challenges are that they have, what barriers they have, um, et cetera. Um, it, you then move on to a stage of defining that need um, and describing it. Uh, from that, you come up with a, a whole bunch of ideas. And at this point, you again, you involve people uh, within your community, your users um, in those ideas. You may then prototype um, and that in a digital world, that may be an actual digital prototype. Um, as I say, design thinking is also used in, 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 um, in relation to designing services. And so, you know, it, that may be a prototype of a service. And then you test it, you gather feedback and you that is an ongoing, um, an ongoing cycle. And I want to zero in, uh, focus in on the first stage, the empathy stage, and really just, um, you know, reiterate the importance of if you are going to create um, 
effective and exceptional digital experiences, you really have to understand and empathize with your users and your audiences. So it's about getting inside their, inside their shoes, inside their mind, whatever expression you like, um, and thinking about those different types of users. Um, it may be that you, your starting point is kind of what you already know about them. Often primary research can be very useful to help you test any assumptions that you're making about users. Um, some of you may have used a process called uh, persona mapping or creation where you um, and, and, and this is not um, creating personas is not unique to um, uh, human centered design or design thinking. It's a it's a tool that's used in many different um, instances. But essentially what we're trying to do now is we're trying to create a series of personas that um, typify our different users. And the reason for doing that, again, is it helps you to be really clear when you're designing um, products and features and functionality that, that they, they are going to work for, for all your um, different types of users. I have a few examples I wanted to share today of different approaches to taking, well, to taking a very user centered, human centered approach to digital platforms. Um, the first example is um, it's uh, the National Archives in the UK. So, um, you know, as I say, none of these examples are libraries, but all of the, um, the learnings and the kind of points I want to make about about these examples are absolutely applicable to digital libraries and libraries generally. So the National Archives is obviously um, the custodians of uh, lots of important documents that, um, uh, you know, that, that kind of uh, catalogue the history of the UK. Um, and we were commissioned by the National Archive to do some research for them to understand the motivations and the profiles of their different users. Um, as, a, as a large organisation, they have a big team of uh, digital analytics specialists. Uh, so they knew a lot about how people were using the website, which bits were the most popular etc they didn't they knew less about who those audiences were uh, what their motivations were um, like many digital libraries um, archives tend to have a lot of specialized users whether that's um, researchers professionals students um, but actually what uh, what they knew less about was those non non specialist users um, which our research showed um, was a substantial, actually the majority of their users were people who were um, coming to research family history um, and over 60% of those were first time uh, visitors. And so thinking about that, it's likely that those sorts of uh, visitors, users are not going to understand how an archive works, perhaps how to use the, the search, etc. And um, I just want to sort of in, in interject um, at this point to just briefly introduce um, the concept of audience development, um, which is something we talk about a lot at the audience agency. So broadly speaking, audience development is a way of thinking about your users and how you grow and reach different types of audiences. And we talk about three different ways of doing that. So you can, uh, you can, um, so you can attract more of the same type of user if there are more of them you can deepen your engagement with an existing type of user or you can try and attract a new type of user so that's broadening your reach um, and as libraries you'll have your own strategies for different for what different types of users you want to reach um, but regardless of the strategy it is important to consider how your digital offer meets the needs of you know all of these different types so coming back to the National Archives then and thinking about that concept of kind of, um, you know, more broader, uh, deeper, what you'll see, you know, fairly straightforward, but very specifically uh, designed at different types of users here. You have on the top half of the home page on the left hand side here, a kind of search the catalog. So those who are familiar with and, and know what they want and know where to find how to find it can just use that search feature. And then you've got um, things like uh you know on the bottom section there popular collections uh research guides that are very much aimed at that um you know substantial audience who are coming who are not um power users as it were um, the National Archives have a strategy for 2019-23 that talks about it's called archives for everyone 
And um, one of the phrases from that is that they want to create new, inclusive, exciting spaces, physical and virtual, in which people can encounter our collection afresh uh, to widen the public experience and understanding of archives. So again, this is really, and the reason for, for mentioning that is because this is why for me, it's so important to be thinking about uh, all your different types of users and ensure you're creating experiences that work um, for all of them. Uh, another quick example here in the National Gallery in London, um, we did some work with them, again, looking at different types of users and mapping user journeys across, uh, you know, it, with digital. Uh, they had a few years ago developed a, an, an audience segmentation um, to help them introduce an, a more of an audience centered approach within the gallery. And so we did some research to understand how if how different users um, use digital, whether they had different journeys or similar journeys. Um, and from that, we were, you know, we were able to kind of define what those user journeys were. Um, so we did this using a number of different methodologies. We did uh, interviews with users, both in the gallery and um, on the telephone. We did some, we set them some, uh, we, we recruited a whole bunch of people and we got them to do some online tasks. Um, and uh, from that, we were able to recreate typical user journeys. So this screenshot is a kind of early phase of, of looking at different uh, types of users. Uh, that then led us to be able to, um, to come up with a kind of typical user journey. So uh, the top one there is for people who are planning a visit. Uh, and then the bottom one is for online only journeys. So again, what this helped, helps the National Gallery to do um, is to be very, very uh, user centered in their approach to developing their digital platform and thinking about what each different types of uh, user segments want and need. Um, obviously, this is just a, a kind of snapshot of a, of a lot more detail that went in, came out of this project. Um, and finally, I just want to talk um, one more example, uh, which is the Welcome Collection in London, who is a free museum and library um, that aims to kind of talk about health and um, science and medicine and so on. Um, so again, you can see that for their online collections, they taking a similar approach to the National Archives and many other organisations in that, that for those users who know what they want, you have a kind of search the collections section. Uh, for those who are less um, familiar with archives and libraries and online collections, they create uh, stories as a kind of way into the content. And of course, this in itself isn't, um, you know, revolutionary. People, you know, organisations like the New York Public Library and others have, have taken a similar approach with their digital collections. Um, but it's just an, a very well done example. Um, and Tom Scott, who is their head of digital, has talked a lot about their approach to making sure that their digital platform is as effective as possible. And so he, he talks about how um, understanding users is at the heart of everything we do. They spend a lot of time understanding what users do, what they want, um, you know, what might be difficult for them to use. Um, Crucially, they think not only about who is currently using that collection, but who they're not reaching and whom they might want to. So that comes back to that point of, you know, audience development and trying to perhaps broaden your reach um, as relevant. And then crucially, they say how our users decide what's good. So again, rather than thinking about uh, what could we do based on ideas that we have in our head, which is fine, um, but, you know, can send you sometimes down a... Um, a kind of a wrong path. Uh, they very much focus or take that very user centered um, design approach. So that's uh, just in summary, really, from me, um, my advice is always to to, um, you know, when you are building and creating uh, particularly digital uh, platforms, it can be very easy to uh, kind of jump into it without thinking about your audiences and users. Um, it is absolutely worth spending as much time as possible finding out about users um, and what they want, what their challenges are, etc. You should absolutely involve them in that process and take the time to talk to them, to understand them. And uh, generally, uh, design thinking is an ongoing process. It's very much about a kind of iterative process and a learning process uh, for continuous improvement. 
Um, as the as the session's been recorded, you will be able to kind of look back on this. I've I've, I've put some some links in there that that some some of you may find uh, useful for for further reading. And um, that's about all for me from now. So I will um, stop sharing my screen. So thank you very much, Katie. Um, I'm just going to make sure I can share my own screen again. So So thank you very much, Katie, for that. That was that, that's excellent, and I think that really gives us some insights into the process that we follow in order to get in order to actually start delivering on all the potential that there is. I think there are a number of really interesting questions, topics for discussion have come up. And um, what we have is in the questions and answer page. We already have a few ideas that have turned up. What I'm going to do is is we're obviously trying to encourage our because and this is all about our, our, our international leaders. We have one question in particular from Madarieni, so I'm just going to allow her to talk and then encourage uh, Madarieni to ask her question directly. Hi, uh, good evening from Indonesia. <laughs> um, my name is Reni. I want to ask a prof part uh, related to the National Digital Libraries uh, of India. And I check from the website that you provide the data sets uh, for COVID-19 uh, in supporting that one. And uh, did, uh, uh, has NDLI support the providers for uh, COVID-19 data set in the Indian, uh, India regions? So it will be specifically related to data set in India. That's it, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for asking. Uh, 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 COVID-19 research resource repository is a very special collection that uh, we are trying to maintain, which is uh, basically a you know all-round uh, uh, research data, whether it's publications, whether it's journals and, and data sets, most importantly. In terms of uh, Indian data, we do have uh, some collections, but um, uh, it would be good to just get in touch with me uh, directly because uh, uh, not all the data that we have, we have been able to put up on the library website as yet. Uh, there would be a lot more data available in the Indian context, which would be available uh, with, uh, you know, references would be available with us. So if you are specifically interested in India specific COVID data of varied kinds, uh, please send me an email and I would uh, get in and I'll, I'll give you some links and put you in touch with some of those who are working with these data sets. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, Prof. <laughs> and um, so another question from the Emerging International Voices comes from Alana. Alana, would you like to ask the question yourself? or if that is not the case, you should be able to activate your microphone now, Alana. Um, so maybe I will just read the question aloud. Um, for a library with limited technological resources who wants to start a digital repository, what do you recommend? I think it's also a question for Professor Parta Pratim Das. Uh, it is the, the big advantage today and the focus should be that uh, be open, you know, there's a whole lot of open source technologies available everywhere, like the whole of uh, National Digital Library of India, which is, though it is supported by the federal government uh, for the last five years. And, uh, but our policy has been to use only open source uh, software. The whole of it is built on that, is whole of it built on or, you know, free software. Uh, and there are a large number of communities around who not only, um, I mean, uh, this not only the software, but a large number of communities who would help you in terms of developing your digital library in case you need help and they don't charge anything. I mean, they're just groups of volunteers like you and me. So the resources of uh, required for building a digital library is more like uh, good intention and human effort that you are ready to put in, but not the funds. So you can get started at any scale and, uh, any specific help you might need uh, from National Digital Library of India 
we would be very happy to extend you that uh, kind of a technical help if you require. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Das. Um, so everyone who's had a look at the questions and answers, you should be able to see there's, a, there's an opportunity to do a thumbs up for questions that you really like. So I would encourage everyone to have a look at the questions that have already been asked as we only have another sort of 10 minutes or so to go. And so do vote for the questions you think are most interesting. Um, we have one question from uh, an anonymous attendee um, who says that in a country like India, like India where digital literacy is, is, is not great, the word used is abysmal, um, how does the National Digital Library of India make use, usage of its systems easy? And I think this is also an interesting question for Katie. You obviously touched on this. Is how, how do you make digital systems work for people who are less comfortable and less, com less confident in using digital? Thank you. And both of you, please answer. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I know okay, Katie will have a more comprehensive answer, so I will go first. Uh, take the advantage of the first responder. Uh, it, is, it is true that uh, digital literacy has not been very great in India. But uh, as I said in, in the last couple of slides that uh, the COVID pandemic uh, had a lot of negative, but a lot of you know, positive impact on change. So it forced people to you know, uh, immediately increase the digital literacy to a very, very great extent. Uh, thousands and thousands of schools uh, in India today are operating solely on online classes and, and you know, the, the kids, their parents, they are all getting, you know, tuned in terms of that kind of a literacy. In terms of uh, connectivity, uh, India has a very high penetration of mobile phones, you know, very, very large. And it is true that uh, internet access still is not everywhere, but uh, we have a, a large network system which can reach to a large, uh, to a good, uh, a good section of people. So uh, when we, during this uh, COVID, uh, when we launched study from home uh, focused activity, the much in the way Katie was explaining, I mean, formally we did not do design thinking, uh, but uh, we did that, we did uh, surveys with schools, with uh, their teachers, with involved them in the design so that we could create collections which students can use effectively. And we have seen a really, really great use of that uh, for uh, school examinations and board examinations, which all have been going on during this period. So yes, there are big challenges and NDLI has to you know, address them. India as a nation has to address them, but we are taking that forward. Thank you very much for asking the question. Um, so from my perspective, I would absolutely agree um with uh, Professor Partha's comments there about it's not a, you know, it's obviously not a problem and a challenge that can be solved by, you know, libraries alone. It, re it requires a, a much, the, the question of um, digital access and digital um, inclusion requires a, a much more um, joined up kind of uh, thinking in terms of government, you know, governments uh, to solve. However, one of the things that we've seen a lot um, probably you know particularly since covid but certainly um regardless of that um is that uh so we work at the audience agency we, we work a lot with cultural organizations who are aiming to reach um different types of communities some of whom may be digitally excluded may not have high levels of digital literacy um and one of the things that we've found is that um when they work uh in a very kind of supportive way with those communities they can actually mitigate some of the issues around digital exclusion. Um, and I think that libraries, I mean, it's kind of easy for me to say this, but I think that libraries are generally in a, a very good position because they are, they tend to work very closely with communities. They tend to have already systems for supporting um, different types of communities, you know, regardless of digital. And so I think it's just thinking of, uh, are there ways in which you can help 
um, certain groups of users to improve their digital literacy, you of course can't always, you can't solve all the problems. You can't solve problems around, um, you know, lack of access to devices perhaps and, and things like that, but you can solve some of the other issues around if people have no, have low confidence in using digital tools and platforms, then often like libraries provide a really good way for them to, you know, kind of develop their confidence levels so I, I, you know i think there are it, it's not a it's not a quick fix and it's there's not a kind of one easy answer but I, I do think libraries are quite well placed to to help deal with some at least some of the issues around kind of digital exclusion thank you um then we have an interesting question from Ilya ragovenko Ilya, would you like to ask the question yourself uh, hello, um, I'm from Russia. My name is Celia. And uh, well, as we started to talk about uh, uh, different uh, communities, uh, here is a question. Uh, how to convert digital users to find patrons of the library? And uh, please, if it's possible, of course, could you bring some specific examples or cases uh, uh, that about uh, binding online with offline? Thank you. So who would like to go first? Maybe Kate, you go first. I don't this mind time. to go first. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Um, well, that's a really good question and a really interesting one. And and I think um, to so so one of the things I would say back to that perhaps is is why, um, and the reason like as in why why do you want to convert online users to offline users? And the reason I say that is partly um, is partly sort of I'm partly joking um, but the the there is so because again we, we work a lot with um, the arts and culture sector and um, particularly before COVID there was a uh, there was always this question or this sense of digital and online users being somehow of less value, um, less important, less meaningful than physical uh, visitors. And um, and that, that can be for very real reasons in the case of arts and culture, because it might be that if you're, um, you know, if you're trying to earn money, you can only do it through physical visitors. In the case of libraries, I think, um, you know, that there is a question about whether if you are providing a very coherent, useful digital service and offer, for some users, it, it doesn't really matter that they don't come to the library, perhaps. Um, however, all that being said, yes, I mean, I think there are, you know, the, the British Library would be a good example of an organisation that blends the kind of offline with online very well. So they will do, a, they they have, they've started running online courses, for example, um, and those online courses, you can then sign up for, uh, you know, physical courses. So, you know, the, and the kind of, and again, the approach of sort of using collections um, online as a, as a draw to get people to come in to see the physical collections. But as I say, I mean, I think, um, you know, that there is also, it is also worth asking the question, why do we feel it's important that we these people physically come to us and there might be a good answer to that but for some users it 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 is actually of as valid for them to engage with you online as it is for them to come physically uh it's, it's, it's a valid question as to do you really want them offline but the question also goes into the fact that librarian as such i mean if we are not only talking about digital library but library service is going beyond being just knowledge collections it is a it is a learning support it is a career development uh, um, uh, you know opportunity it is uh, in, i mean i'll just give you one two examples um, in las vegas uh, clark county uh, public library in a certain region, they have opened a section of the library where there is a, a, a lot of services available, which is after school. That area was not uh, is is not a has not been a great area, and uh, many of the kids who go to school do not have the opportunity of parental care after uh, the school. So the the library promotes that uh, these kids come to the library, do their homework, they get uh, support of various 
you know, uh, recreational services. Uh, they can learn how to become a DJ and so on and so forth. So the libraries often to for the for being valuable offline is going beyond the traditional library services. So that that definition of library itself will keep on somewhat changing. But well, if we just take the the online collection or knowledge dissemination component, then I, I would fully agree with Katie is probably there's not much uh, physical reasons of how much you, do, you would want the users to be really offline. But I mean, you can engage with the user through the online mode and provide a whole lot of services offline in your physical library, which many of the public libraries like this Las Vegas County, you look at New York Public Library, you look at San Francisco Library, they all have programs which are structured in that integrated manner. That's what I'll uh, have on this uh, for you. Perfect. Thank you, Professor Das. I think we have time for one more question, and we're going to give that to one of our emerging international voices, Zane Silna. Um, I'm asking, uh, asking her to unmute, and hopefully she'll be able to ask her question in person. Zane. Yep. Hi, greetings from Latvia. So my question, I guess, is for Katie. Um, what, are, what would be the best way for small public library, libraries to attract new audiences using digital services? I think it's especially, it's especially important now when, when um, you know, there exists, you know, new people, you can't go out that easily physically, uh, how to reach them? I guess uh, social media would be one way, but maybe there are new, uh, more ways how to, how to reach them, how to attract them. Uh, yeah, really, really good. Another really good question. Um, so I, I think the short answer to that is yes, social media is an obvious one. I think um, Professor Partha mentioned the, the use of social media by the um, National um, Digital Library in India as a way to kind of reach um, different audiences. The, the good thing about social media is as well is that you if you do it in the right way, you can potentially reach um, audiences and users that you might you know that might not already be engaging with you and interacting with you um but it's about being quite considered about how you do that so so what is the the social media has a very specific context if you think about it when somebody's on your website um they are already sort of in your in your world if that makes sense and when they're on social media they are in their world so they are you know looking at their news feed and that is made up of all sorts of things um based on you know things that their friends are posting groups that they're in etc and so your whatever you you post to social media you know as a library has to connect with those people it has to seem relevant to them and that that can be harder than it seems um, you have to be quite clear about what your you know how you present stuff you have to have a kind of quite um uh a quite a specific approach to that but but social media is is a good way absolutely and it's i, I would say you know probably universally and in terms of internationally it's it's a really good way um it's just that it again it requires a bit of thinking because it's harder than it looks i would say to to sort of do it well Did you, uh, Professor Das, did you have anything to add on that one? No, I, 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 I think uh, it's, a, it's a very comprehensive answer. I would not just like to explain that. Thank you. Perfect. So thank you to both of you. I think that, that was our last question. But what we will do is we will harvest all of the questions that have been asked and share them with the speakers if they have the time to offer any further details. Um, I think there have been a couple of questions about sharing presentations, recordings, so the recording of this webinar will be available, um, along with the links that are included in, 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 the, in the presentations. Um, what we were going to do now is to finish, as promised, by asking the same question again. So just to get a sense of whether having listened to our speakers, to Professor Das and to Katie Moffat, do you think differently about whether libraries in your country are taking advantage of the possibilities offered by digital technologies. So we're up on the screen. And so let's have another minute or a little bit less to see where the votes go. Okay, already 25. We're voting quicker this time. I think <laughs> the discussions have made up people's minds.
I'm hoping we're not more pessimistic now. Okay, up to 30 seconds. Let's give it another 15 seconds, and then we'll be able to end on time. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to end the polling and share the results. So these should show up on the screen now. And I think, oh, this is positive. I think it, it seems that some of the people who are cautiously optimistic on six or seven, some have got less optimistic and have dropped to a five, and some have got more optimistic and dropped to an eight. We do have three more people than at the beginning who are very optimistic who believe that libraries are taking advantage of possibilities and still two pessimists who say there's no chance at all so thank you um, so i think that brings us to the end of where we are today i, I wanted on behalf of, of gerald who's unfortunately had to drop off to offer sincere thanks for to professor das and to katie moffat for your participation Thanks to everyone who, who's shared their questions, who's shared their reflections, their ideas. I think it's been a really lively discussion. It could have gone on for a lot longer. Um, and in a quick message to our Emerging International Voices participants, please stay on the line. We'll take a 10 minute break and then come back again. So please don't leave. But other than that, thank you very much. And please do join us next week at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.